And the earth is rolled up like a scroll The trumpets will blow And the world will fall to its knees As we go home Welcome to Calvary Church. My name's Drew. I want to invite you to stand and sing as we worship together. We're going to do a song that might be a little newer for some of you, but it's just a great reminder how Christ is not only our Lamb of Salvation, but He's our King like a lion. Let's sing. He's coming on the clouds. Kings and kingdoms will bow down. Shame will break as broken hearts declare his praise. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the lion, the lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before him. Our God is the lamb. For the sin of the world, His blood breaks the chains. 
Make way before the King of Kings Our God who comes to save Is here to set the captives free For who can stop the Lord Almighty Our God is the Lion The Lion of Judah He's roaring with power In fighting our battles And every knee will bow before Him Our God is the Lamb The Lamb that was slain For the sin of the world His blood breaks the chains And every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb For every knee will bow before Him Who can stop the Lord Welcome to Calvary Church. My name is Scott Messner, and we are so glad that you're here with us this morning. If you missed last week, Happy New Year. If last weekend you were like really into New Year's resolutions, it's none of my business, but I hope one week later you still are into New Year's resolutions and keeping with them, and everyone has been able to kick off 2017 on the right foot. Uh, at Calvary Church, uh, we know we're a large church. And so if it's your first time here, or maybe you're one of those resolution people that you're like, I'm going to get back into church, I'm going to start going back to church, we're so glad that you're here with us this morning. And one of the ways that we attempt to help this big church feel like a family is through what we call the welcome gathering. The welcome gathering takes place after this and, and every service, and it's an opportunity for us to get acquainted with you, for you uh, to, to meet some of our staff and some of our volunteers. It takes only a couple of minutes of your time, and it's a great opportunity for us to say hello. If you have any questions, we'd love to answer those as well. So immediately following the service, go out any of the doors in the back, turn right, head down the end of the lobby and look for signs that say welcome gathering. It takes only a few minutes of your time and it's a great opportunity for us uh, to be able to just greet you and to say hello. Well, another way that we help this large church feel like a family is that we eat lunch together. Uh, so lunch is back on today, uh, come one, come all. Uh, it happens in our fellowship hall, out the back doors, turn to your right and look to your left. Uh, and we would love to have you join with us for lunch. For us, it's a great opportunity to kind of extend the conversation, extend the fellowship, to meet new people uh, over lunch. And so we would love for any and all who are interested today, uh, and if you don't feel like cooking, even more reason to come to lunch. So we would love to have you at lunch. Well, at the incredible risk of kind of being over-repetitive or redundancy, I want to say 
something one last time. At Calvary Church, we're a large church that attempts to feel like a family. But there are seasons within this ministry and with uh, our church that we don't just feel like a family, we actually act like a family. And it's with great pride that these moments happen. They happen throughout the year in different people's lives. But I want to tell you about one situation that's happening right now where we need the family to sort of lean in together. Uh, one of our values at Calvary Church is going into God's world. As we pursue life in Christ, we say we want to be a people going into God's world. So we're extending the gospel both here and around the world. One of the primary ways we do that around the world is by raising up and sending out our own uh, into the world to proclaim and to extend the gospel. One such family that we sent out 28 years ago from our own midst is Steve and Jemmy Rohr. There's the Rohr family. They've been serving faithfully in Japan for 28 years, presenting and discipling and talking to people about the gospel and living out the gospel and serving people well for 28 years. Their youngest daughter, uh, her name is Julia. Julia is 15 years old, and when she was born, was born with a very rare liver disorder. Throughout her entire life, she's had many, many ups and downs uh, with her liver condition. And recently, over the last year, doctors in Japan have concluded uh, that the, really the only way forward now is for Julia to have a complete liver transplant. Uh, her father, Steve, uh, it was tested, and he was proven to be a good a donor, and so he will be donating his liver to his daughter. In the midst of all that, though, they realized and learned through insurance that the medical procedure that needs to take place is not covered by insurance. And the hospital said, you're going to need to raise up $100,000 to take care of this need. So his heart sank, but then he began to pray, began to extend the, the the need that was there. And so one of the things we want to do this morning is rejoice with what God was able to accomplish already through this family. Uh, the Benevolent Committee, through your generous donations, gave $25,000. The remaining $75,000 was covered through generous donations from around the world. Uh, and so we can celebrate that although Julia isn't our biological daughter, in the family of God, when one member hurts, when one member rejoices, we all experience it and we respond alike. And so we're going to continue to monitor the financial situation. We'll let you know if the, uh, the surgery costs more than what they've already raised. But at this point, we're celebrating and we're praising the Lord for what he has provided. Now, there is one more way we need you as a family to respond, and that's through prayer. Uh, Julia's surgery takes place in Japan next Monday morning, which for us is Sunday evening, January 15th at 6 p.m. The surgery starts. So if you've got a, a date book, if you keep your calendar on your device, I'd even encourage you now, just put a, put a reminder in there uh, throughout this week, even maybe on Sunday, next Sunday at 6 p.m., to just pray for the entire Roar family. Uh, the surgery will take about 24 hours. It'll involve about 100 medical professionals, so it's pretty serious stuff. So we're asking you as a, as a family to respond. Uh, over the summer, I had the opportunity to talk to Julia's father, Steve, and I said, Steve, you know, there's probably going to be many times where I represent you in front of people. Can you tell me specifically, what would you want us to pray about? Without missing a beat, this is the two things he said. He said, Scott, pray, of course, that this surgery would go well, that physically and medically, that Julia would be able to live a long and healthy life following this surgery. And then the second thing he said is, through this whole experience, we have experienced nothing other than the love and the grace and the mercy of a good and gracious Heavenly Father. And our prayer is that more would come to know and to experience the love of God because of our situation. So that's what we're praying. That's what we're asking you to pray for on their behalf. Uh, let's do that now as I pray this morning. Father, we thank you that you are indeed a good and faithful father. We pray for Steve and Jemmy as parents of Julia. We pray that your peace and that your love would be experienced by them anew each day. We pray for Steve as he prepares to be the donor, that you would strengthen him physically so that his body would be prepared well for the surgery. We pray for Jemmy. As a wife and mother, would you give her strength and courage that comes only from you? We pray for Julia. Would you do an amazing work in her body that this surgery would be a medical success? Lord, we would echo Steve's prayer that regardless of the outcome, that more would come to see your goodness and your love for each of us. Father, we thank you for the way that you're at work right here in our own area. 
Lord, would you continue to bless and use this ministry to demonstrate your goodness and faithfulness to us. I pray for the many here this morning with various, various needs. Would you enter into those situations? Would you surround them with your grace and love? Father, as we begin a new year, would you help our hearts and our minds, our actions to be more aligned with you? Would you strengthen each marriage and each family? Would we as a body partner with you in continuing to love one another and to extend the gospel right here? Lord, as we continue, would you use the songs we sing, the words we hear to bless and to challenge each of us? Would you take us from where we are to where you want us to be? This morning, would we come face to face with your love in a new and a fresh way? a way that empowers us through the Spirit to live lives marked by your love, your grace, and your forgiveness. We thank you for your continued goodness, your continued love towards us, and pray we would be faithful stewards to extend that to one another. In Jesus' name, amen. At this time, I'll ask the ushers to come forward. As we take the offering, feel free to sing with us. You 
Love came down and rescued me. Love came down and set me free. I am yours. I am forever yours. Mountain high, valley low, I sing out. like to offer my welcome and happy new year to all of you. Uh, my name is Bo. I'm the senior pastor here at Calvary Church, and it is such a privilege and an honor for me to stand before you week after week to open up God's word together in the context of community uh, and to see what God has to say to us and help us to understand what it looks like to live life from a biblical worldview, from a biblical perspective, and I am so excited to start this series today called Are You With Me? It's Jesus asking that question of his closest followers then, but he also asked that same question to us today. And we're going to be looking at this over these next uh, weeks and even months um, at a very particular part of Scripture that is significant and meaningful, and I'm going to introduce that to you today. Uh, but it's the beginning of the year, and it's a good time to hit the reset button just a little bit. I know there's some that are new that are with us uh, here this morning, and that's wonderful. And, but, but for all of us, it's even a good reminder that one of the ways that we answer that question, are you with me, in the affirmative, is to be involved in connected to a local church, a local group, a local body of believers, whether it's here at Calvary or, 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 or another church, whatever it might be, one of the things that we say here at Calvary over and over again is we love the local church just as much as we love Calvary Church because we believe it's the way that God is working in the world today through his church, through his people. So whether it's this church or another church, we want to kind of make sure we understand what that is and, and why we're doing what we're doing. So here at Calvary Church, our vision statement is simply this, pursuing life in Christ. We want to help every person, no matter where you might be on your journey, on your walk with God, to be pursuing a life that's found in in Jesus Christ. I think everybody in the world today is trying to pursue life in something. It might be finances. It might be possessions. It might be their career. It might be relationships. And all of those things in and of themselves are not bad, but we believe and I believe that the abundant life that Jesus has to offer is found in him 
And when those other aspects of life are put in that perspective, they're wonderful things to pursue, but we need to know and to understand what it looks like to pursue life in Jesus Christ and the life that we have that's found in him and because of what he has done. So our desire at Calvary Church is to help everyone, no matter who you are, how old you are, what your background is, to understand what that looks like and to help you take what your natural next step would be in that pursuit of Jesus Christ. And we do that by living out our five values. These five values, loving God, living God's word, growing with God's people, going into God's world, investing in God's work, is foundational to everything that we do. From the nursery, the whole way up through senior adults, this is foundational to who we are and what we want to be about. Another way to think about it is like this. These five values are the marks or the characteristics of somebody that is pursuing life in Christ. Some people come to me and say, how do I know if I'm pursuing life in Christ? And I come back and say, are you loving God? Are you living God's word? Are you growing with God's people? Are you going into his world? You you say, yeah, I, I see doing that. I want to grow in those areas, but that's what it looks like to be pursuing life in Christ. So when we think about why we gather here on Sunday mornings, We gather here all together because we have a desire to come and to do these five values, but particularly that value of loving God. So we come here to Calvary Church, 9, 15, 11 o'clock for this corporate community gathering of of God's people. And and we want people to come and to be a part of this and make this a a priority in in what's going on. And uh, we don't divide people up based on their preferences. We think there's value in the body of Christ coming together. We live in a culture that wants to divide us up based on our likes and our dislikes and this and that. We think there's great value in, in the church being intergenerational and all of us, you know, coming come in here together and you know as a result um, each week when we gather like this we're gonna you know open God's word we're gonna sing together this singing that we do looks a little bit uh, looks a little bit different and, and and as you reflect back I don't know if you do much reflecting the way that I do I like to reflect back on things and see how they go when I reflect back on our Christmas series this year for those of you that were here I hope that many of you were here for for the whole month but if you weren't I think what we did at Christmas this year was just a great reflection of who we are as a church. The first Sunday in December, choir and orchestra are up here leading us in the the songs of Christmas. The week after that, our King's kids, our elementary kids were up here, not performing for us, but leading us in singing. The week after that, we had some guests in, the Gettys, Keith and Kristen Getty, and help us to understand Christmas from an Irish perspective. Then Christmas Eve, man, we sung tons of carols together. It's a little bit more of a contemporary feel to it. Then Christmas Day, we came back and the organ was out and we sang some, some traditional hymns on Christmas and, and Piercing Word was here and some of the songs that they did were right from Handel's Messiah. And so when I look at the scope of the month of Christmas, I said, man, that's who we are as a family at Calvary Church, and I just love that diversity. Um, Our other value of living God's word, it's why we open up God's word in all of our environments. We don't want to just know, we don't want to just memorize, not even enough just to understand, but we want to live out God's word. So that's why on Sunday mornings we do a series like we're starting today, going through a book of the Bible or, or, or part of a book of Bible or looking at something that's topical to help us to understand how we can live out God's word. And then I'm not going to talk about all of them, but they're our fifth value of investing in God's work. All of us are investing in all kinds of things all the time. But if we can be investing in what God is actually doing, man, there is great returns on that investment because we're a part of something that's eternal. Let me just give you one small example of why I love the local church and how you all uh, get to participate in this. A couple months ago, we did our Thanksgiving offering, and you, you guys all gave over and above. We raised uh, over $100,000, and a big part of that was giving money to our partner organizations right here in Lancaster County. One of the approaches that we've taken is said, man, we want to be involved in helping those that are, you know, in distress. We want to help the poor. We want to help, you know, refugees. We want to do all these types of things as a church. But there's organizations that are already doing that, and really they're knocking it out of the park, doing a great job at that. Why would we reinvent the wheel? Let's partner with them. So I had the privilege of writing a a letter to each of these organizations that included a $10,000 check 
check to each of them because of the giving of all of you and the giving through, through our Benevolence Fund uh, to, to organizations like Water Street Mission, who's restoring lives through rescue and renewal right here in downtown Lancaster. North Star, restoring women from sex trafficking, addressing physical, psychological, emotional, and spiritual needs through Christ through a Christ-centered focus. Bethany Christian Services, adoption and family services, and they're working with refugees, doing a great, great job. Susquehanna Valley Pregnancy Services, their desire and their goal is to have a salvation-full and abortion-free region. Hope Within, providing health care for those uh, that need it in the name of Jesus. And then Love, Inc., helping churches connect uh, with the needs in their community. I'm so thankful for all of you in the way that you give, that then we can partner and make a difference, not just with what's happening here at Calvary Church, because there's great things that are happening here, but we want to partner with some of the great things that are happening in our community. So thank you so much for investing in God's work and investing in what he's doing right here at Calvary Church. One final thought on this. In a few weeks, we're going to have a family meeting. You heard Scott talking all morning about how we're a big church, but we're a family. And from time to time, families get together and have a meeting. I've got four girls, and sometimes I say, girls, family meeting, and everybody piles and gets on the couch. Um, We're not all going to fit on that green couch, but we're all going to come together on the morning of January 29th in the fellowship hall, 8 o'clock or 9.15, still our regular services right here in this room at 9.15, 11 o'clock. No ABFs that morning, but it's a great time to come and to get, you know, some behind the scenes, some insider information on what's happening here at Calvary Church, where we've been, where we're going, some updates on some of the projects and, and things that are, that, that are coming up. And if you're newer to Calvary Church, you're welcome to come to that. What a great opportunity to get a glimpse of what's happening and what's going on behind the scenes. So some of you are going to say, you're going to hear, oh, my ABF's not meeting that day. That might be a day that we don't come. No, no. You need to be here on the 29th. Commit to come into one of those meetings in the fellowship hall. Join us for worship afterwards uh, that morning as well. Uh, It's just a great opportunity to get us all on the same page as we head into the new year. Okay. Speaking of being on the same page, today we begin a series entitled, Are You With Me? This comes, this statement comes from a a time that Jesus is spending with his closest followers. And we find that, you know, some people call it a discourse, that time of teaching in only one of the four gospels, in John's gospel, right? Kind of in the middle of the gospel in John chapter 13. So I want to invite all of you, if you have your Bibles, to open with me to John chapter 13. It's found on page 900. That's in the Pew Bible in front of you. And even though I put the verse up on the screen, and I often do that from week to week, we encourage you, we want you, whether it's on an electronic device or, or you know, paper, you know, book, you know, or the Bible that's in front of you, to open that Bible, to see it for yourself. I'm trying to equip you to, to read and to study and to understand the Bible for yourself. So having it and being able to see it in front of you is a great way to do that. So, you know, so bring your Bibles here on Sunday morning. Open with me. Uh, it's a great opportunity to, to, to do that. We We always provide an outline for you in the bulletin. At the bottom of today's outline is the next few um, uh, titles and passages in this series. I know some of you like to read ahead so you can see where we're going over these next few weeks uh, as we dig into these middle chapters here in John's uh, gospel. But the first verse of this discourse, the first verse of his teaching, gives us a great glimpse at what's really happening and what's really going on in the context for what we're going to look at over these next weeks. John chapter 13, verse 1 says this. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. This gives the context for these whole series, and we're just going to focus in on this one verse today so that we can really set the stage for where we're headed uh, and be prepared for this series over these next couple weeks. So I'm going to break down this verse for us. I'm going to do it a little bit in a different order than it's presented here, and I want to start right there in the middle of the verse when, Jesus, when it says, when Jesus knew that his hour had come. When we get to the part in Jesus' life In Jesus' ministry, Jesus understood that his time on earth was coming to an end. 
He'd been with his closest followers. He had been with the crowds for several years, teaching, healing, connecting, relate, developing relationships. But he knew that his ultimate purpose of coming to planet Earth was to end up on the cross and dying on the cross. And what we're about to study over these next weeks is what Jesus discusses and talks about with his closest followers just hours before the end of his physical life here on earth. And it's interesting to me, I just want you to see this. In John's gospel, there's 21 chapters. The first 12 chapters talk about different events and different miracles and different teachings and things that Jesus did in his life. When we get to chapter 13, we're just hours before his crucifixion. So essentially, the second part of John's gospel is all about these last moments of Jesus' life. What that tells me is there's so much significance in what Jesus is going to say and teach in these last moments that John wanted to spend a good bit of time on that teaching. One of the things that he wants his closest followers to know, and I think he wants you and I to know as well, and we're going to talk a little bit more about this uh, today, is the fact that he loved them. The word agape, the deepest type of love, is a favorite word in John's gospel. But in chapters 1 through 12, that word's used seven times. But in the four chapters, the main four chapters we're going to look at, 13 through 17, or five chapters, that word is used 25 times. It's going to be emphasized over and over and over again, the love that he has for them. And we titled the series, Are You With Me?, Because I really think that's what Jesus is saying, and I think it has a double meaning. I think he's saying, are you with me? Are you hearing me? Are you understanding what I'm saying to you? Are you following me? Are you following my train of thought? But I think it goes deeper than that. I think he's asking and preparing these guys as his death is imminent and upon him, he's saying, are you guys going to continue to follow me? If you know anything about the life of the disciples... When they were with Jesus and living life with Jesus, they were all over the place. And Jesus is trying to kind of get them on board and get them on mission and get them understanding who he is and what he's about and saying, are you with me? Now, some of you looked at what I just did and said, oh, now I get it. Some of you, maybe not. We'll work on that over these next couple weeks. So one of the things that Jesus is doing is he's closing the doors. He's pulling his closest followers in to him, and he's got some very significant things that he wants to say. And we get to eavesdrop on that conversation, and that's what's going to be talked about and discussed over these next weeks. I envision it like this. It's like a father or a grandfather, the patriarch of a family, knowing that he's near the end of his life, and he pulls the family together because he's got some last things that he wants to share and talk with them about. If you've ever been in that situation, do you pay attention to what's being said? Absolutely. Because it's not trivial things, it's important things that are going to be said. Maybe it's also like that military general who pulls the troops together before that critical battle that's about to take place. Final instructions, final motivation for what they're about to do. The one illustration that connects with me is thinking about a coach. A coach giving that pregame talk, or maybe more appropriately, it's that halftime talk. The scouting has been done, the film sessions have been gone through, the game plan has already come up, they've already come up with the game plan. But this is the opportunity of the coach to pull them together one final time before he sends them out. For those of you that are over 40, you remember the moment when the 1980 U.S. Olympic team beat the Soviet Union up in Lake Placid. You remember that moment and the thrill that was there and the patriotism and, you know, the, you know, amazing underdogs that they were and they come and to, to win that game and uh, a movie was made about that game called Miracle and when they pulled that movie together Kurt Russell played the coach Herb Brooks and when they had Kurt Russell do the 
pregame talk in the locker room, they interviewed some of the actual players from the 80 Olympic team, and they said, tell us what Coach Brooks said in that moment. They re re got them all together, they recorded what they said, and they recreated the speech that he gave, and they said he did a wonderful job of doing it. So on that day, Herb Brooks pulls this group of really, they were teenagers, they were guys, they were college students in their early 20s going against the best hockey team in the world, and he said this, he said, great moments are born from great opportunities. And that's what you have here tonight. That's what you've earned here tonight. One game. If we played them 10 times, they might win nine. But not this game. Not tonight. Tonight, we skate with them. Tonight, we stay with them. And we shut them down because we can. Tonight, we are the greatest hockey team in the world. Gives you chills, doesn't it? Some of you are going to go home, you're going to Google that speech. You're going to go watch the movie. He goes on and talks about them being born to be hockey players. And the Soviets' time is done, and this is our time. And on that one night in Lake Placid, they were the greatest hockey team in the world. There is something about pulling that group together that's gone through so much together and giving them one final chance one final speech, one final time together before they get sent out, and that's what Jesus is doing. Now, did it take on the tone of a coach doing a pregame talk? Not necessarily, but it was filled with intimacy, it was filled with passion, it was filled with purpose, and it was filled with mission. And it's going to speak to them about some of their felt needs, some of their disappointments, some of their misunderstandings. It's going to speak to them about what it means and what it looks like to be a follower of Jesus Christ on planet Earth after Jesus dies, is resurrected, and ascends into heaven. And you and I struggle with some of those same exact questions today. That's why I think this series is going to be so important and significant and impactful for all of us as we go through it. So back to verse 1. Jesus knew his hour had come to depart out of the world. So he's preparing them for what life is going to be like once he's gone. And then John tells us this. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. John wants us to know, as we look, as the curtain is pulled back on this teaching, one of the things that John wants to make sure that, that we all know is that Jesus loved his disciples, and he loves you, and he loves us just as much as he loved them. So as we think about this concept of being loved by Jesus, let me just ask you, do you recognize and do you know, and does it actually impact the, your life that you are loved by God and that you are loved by Jesus? For those of us that have put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ would fall into that category of being called his own. You say, well, if that's not true of me, then, then does God not love me? No, God loves everyone. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He loves the world. But there's an aspect, it's not a, a deeper love, it's just a different love for his own. Let me maybe just illustrate it simply this way. As the pastor, I love Calvary Church. I love the people of Calvary Church. I love all of you. And one of my deepest desires and one of the things that motivates me as a pastor is helping and equipping all of you to pursue life in Christ. And I love you, but not the same way that I love my wife. And I think rightly so. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. 
I think it's a great way to start this series and a great, great way to start the new year. Do you know that you are loved by Jesus? How would it change the way that you live and interact with other people if you were convinced of that fact? So on your outline, I've got just a couple verses. I'm going to go through them fairly quickly. But a little bit later in this chapter, John, who's writing this to us, says this. One of his disciples, and he's referring to himself. He's talking about himself in the third person. One of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Now, he could have described or referred to himself in lots of different ways. He could have described himself based on his occupation, based on his family lineage, but he chose, not just here, but in other places in the gospel, to identify himself by the fact that he is loved by Jesus. You identify yourself in lots of different ways. Do you identify yourself as somebody that's loved by Jesus? Now, I'm not suggesting you introduce yourself to people that way. Hey, I'm Bo Eckert, and I'm loved by Jesus. It might be an awkward conversation going forward from there. But think about the way that we do describe ourselves to people. If I meet somebody new, very early in the conversation, the conversation will often turn to, well, what do you do for a living? Why? Because that's how we identify ourselves. Or we identify ourselves by our family. Oh, you know, so-and-so is my dad or so-and-so is my grandfather. You know, here's what I get all the time. Oh, Calvary Church, do you know? And they expect that I know everyone. Or is so-and-so at Calvary Church related to this? I say, yes, everybody at Calvary Church is somehow related and connected, whatever. And, and so those conversations, we are identified by our family and who we're related to. We're identified by our hobbies. Oh, he likes to play tennis. He likes to play golf. He's a Steelers fan. He's a Yankees fan. You know, whatever it might be, we identify ourselves this way. You know, some of us, you know, we're identified by where we live or what we drive or, you know, what our job might be. We're identified by all of those different things. But do you recognize the fact that you are identified as someone who is loved by Jesus Christ, loved by your heavenly Father. And it should change the way that we live. It should change the way that we interact with one another. You say, yeah, I think I recognize that I'm loved, but sometimes what we struggle with is, am I always loved? Romans chapter 8 reminds us that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present or things to come, nor powers nor height, depth, or anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Nothing. Some of you, you wouldn't say this out loud, but some of the, the, the self-talk that happens in your head is, yeah, I feel good. I'm doing my devotions. I'm coming to church. God's happy with me. God loves me. Oh, I had a bad week. I did this and I cursed and I, you know, spread this rumor and I gossiped about this person. Oh, God must love me less. Nothing separates us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. You say, well, how do I know? Because I don't always feel it. I'm a very emotional person. I would have loved to have been there like John and to recline on Jesus' bosom and be with Jesus in an intimate relationship. I probably would have felt loved by him. When I don't feel loved by Jesus, how do I know that he still loves me? Romans chapter 5, verse 8 says this. But God shows his love. He demonstrates his love. We looked up the word this week. It literally means to give evidence to or to prove something. Actions that prove a characteristic. He shows and demonstrates his love for us. Doesn't say you know that he loves you if you have that feeling in your heart. God shows his love for us 
in that while we were still sinners, some of you think that he died for you because you've gotten your act together. Oh, he loves me because I started to come to church. He loves me because I read my Bible. He loves me because I do this. He loves me because I put money in the offering basket. No, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God demonstrates, he shows, he proves his love by dying, by sending Jesus to die on the cross. It's a very simplistic illustration. But I've come to my wife, Erica, and I said, what can I do to show or to demonstrate or to help you, to help you to see, to help you to know that I love you? What can I do to, that would show and help, uh, you know, with what goes on around the house with the girls, and I know that things are busy at home, and kids are growing up, and we have a teenager now, and, you know, all these things happening around our house. What can I do? And she's come back to me, and she said, if you could make sure that the dishwasher gets unloaded when it's clean, that would get my day started right. Amen. There you go. Amen. <laughs> now, husbands, that's a great conversation to have on the way home. Even if you just say, if there's one thing that I'm not doing now that I could do that would help and show you, what would it be? It might be as easy as unloading the dishwasher. For some of you, I apologize now because they might give you a whole list of things and I've just ruined your weekend. But it's still a worthwhile conversation to have. She knows that I love her. It's just one of the ways that I demonstrate it, to put it on display, to, to show evidence of the love that's there. He shows us that he loves us, sending Jesus to die on the cross. One last verse. Paul prays this prayer in Ephesians chapter 3. That you, that includes all of us, being rooted and grounded in love. What is your life rooted and grounded in this morning? You may have strength to comprehend, to understand with all the saints, all of us together. That's why we gather together. It's not an individualistic thing, our relationship with Christ, that we would have strength to comprehend with all of us what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. It's great to have our theological ducks in a row. Absolutely. But this morning, do you know that you are loved by Christ? That you may be filled with all the fullness of God. I don't know about you, but I want that to be true in my life. I want to be filled with the fullness of God. I want to be godly. I want to be like him. What does it look like to be like him? It's knowing and understanding his love. To be filled up with that so that when life squeezes us, that's what comes out. Notice how this word fullness or being filled is used all over the scripture. Let me just give you two examples. John chapter 1, same author, same book that we're looking at. This is just earlier in his gospel. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus pulled on skin, came down to planet earth, walked around so that we could see his glory, see the essence of who he is. Glory as of the only son from the father, full of what? Grace and truth. We see the fullness of God when we look at Jesus. Two verses later. And from his fullness, from the fullness of Jesus, you and I have received grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. When Jesus is filled up, it's filled, he's filled up with grace and truth and love. So that's what overflows to us. And when we are filled up with that, that's what then overflows to others. Let me ask you just a very awkward question this morning. It says, from his fullness, we receive grace upon grace. Again, it's an awkward question. What do people receive from your fullness? From the fullness of who you are, what do they receive? If we are filled with the love of Christ and the grace of Christ, and our life gets squeezed like a sponge, that's what's going to come out. 
Sometimes, this isn't a reality for me. From my fullness, you know what sometimes people get? Sarcasm. Um, judgmentalism. Not sure that's even a word. Um, critique. The list goes on and on. Bitterness. Jealousy. Is that what comes from your fullness? Or from your fullness do people receive grace and love? And truth. We want to be praying these types of prayers so that we're filled with the fullness of Christ so that when other people encounter us, that's what they experience. Filled with his fullness. Just one more thought here. Another phrase that we say, and it's not always a good thing, we say, he's full of it. That's not a positive thing when somebody says that about us and we won't fill in the blank with what we might be full of. But there's something about being filled with the fullness of God that's connected to the love of Christ and knowing and understanding that, that this is what we want to be praying for ourselves, for our kids, for the situations in our lives. Some of us, you know what our prayer lives consist of? Thank you for this day. Help me get through this day. Help me get better because I'm not feeling well. Help me to do this. Help me to do that. Isn't it great when, when Scott stood up here and talked about what the Rohr family is praying for this surgery? Yeah, that everything goes well. It's wonderful to pray those things. But as a result of this, that more and more and more people would know the gospel and the love of Christ. So as you're praying for all those things that you normally pray about, that's great. Just include this type of language with it. So that we would know the love of Christ and be filled with his fullness. One final thought from John chapter 13 as we kick this series off. He gives us the context of when this took place. Now, before the feast of the Passover, I'm not gonna talk a lot about that today. We're gonna talk about it as we get into this series. What's the timing of this? And when was the feast of Passover? And what is it? And what were they celebrating? And what's the day of preparation? And how does all that work with Thursday and Friday and Saturday? And we're gonna get into all of that. But just so again, we understand the context of it all. It's during the feast of Passover that Jesus is gathering his disciples in this upper room. And Passover was a time that the Jews came together to celebrate God bringing the nation of Israel out of Egypt and out of slavery. And Jesus takes the context of that celebration and he says, I'm going to give you something new to celebrate. I'm going to give you something new that you don't understand now, but you will. And he came to them during this meal and he took bread and he took wine and he said, you're going to use this from now on as a tool to remember what is about to happen to me in a few hours. Jesus knew, remember, that his hour had come. He knew he was about to die on the cross for the sins of the world. And he said, that's so important and that's so significant that I need for you to have a way of remembering and giving thanks and celebrating that. So it's in the context of this upper room teaching, this upper room discourse, that he institutes communion, what we still come and celebrate today. John doesn't give us the details. We actually have to look to Paul and to, and to Luke and some of the other gospel writers to understand what happened during that time. And Luke tells us that this is what happened. That Jesus took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to them. And he said this. He said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now, it doesn't mean that the piece of bread actually becomes the body of Christ. But Jesus, knowing that we're good forgetters, gives us a physical, tangible reminder of what he had done for us in dying on the cross. I think it's brilliant. He put something in their hand that they could see, that they could feel, that they could touch, that they could taste, that they could smell. Engaged all of their senses to be reminded of what he did for us on the cross. 
And then he went on and said this, and likewise the cup after they had eaten. And he said, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant. Now that's a word that we don't often use, but a covenant is a contract. A contract between two parties. And he says, this is the new contract between humanity and between God. This contract is now going to explain to you and help you to understand how the, the separation between man and God is taken care of. And this contract is written, this covenant is written, it's signed in my blood. My blood is shed for you to wipe out and take away your sins. Notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say that this contract, that this covenant is written in our good works, in our good deeds. No, no. It's written in the blood of Jesus. So when we come together, we take a piece of bread and we take a cup of juice as a physical, tangible reminder of what he has done for us. The actual bread and juice do nothing to save us. His death on the cross and our belief and trust in that is what saves us. This helps us to remember and reminds us of what he's done for us. Great way to start this series. Great, great way to start the new year. I'm going to invite the musicians to come and we're going to uh, distribute and we're going to take communion together as we do that here uh, at Calvary Church. Um, I know that there's, one, the way that we do it here is we'll distribute the bread and everybody will, will get the bread and we'll listen to the music and we can pray and reflect and, and, and think it through. And, uh, and then after everybody's been served and, and the, the, the men come back down, I'll lead us and we'll take it together and then we'll do the same with the cup. I know there's lots of kids in the room. Parents, I know it's a little bit of a, a solemn time, but it's also a great time for you to do some teaching, do some parenting right there in the pew uh, of teaching and helping them to explain and understand what we've done. And um, this is an open communion table, which means you don't have to be a member of Calvary Church to, to, to participate with us today. If you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, absolutely, you take this with us. And parents, you know where your kids are and, and, uh, and whether they should participate or not. And whichever you choose there, either way, it's still a great time to talk with them and, and teach them and explain to them uh, what's happening. So, um, so let's bow, let's pray uh, for the bread, and then we'll all be served together. Father, thank you that you made a way, a new covenant, a new contract, so that our relationship with you could be fixed, could be repaired, could be rescued, could be reconciled and redeemed. And it came through the body of Jesus, his death on the cross. And thank you for giving us a physical, tangible reminder of what he did for us. And as we take this bread now, it reminds us that we give thanks for the death of Jesus on our behalf. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.
scriptures tell us that while they were in that upper room, while he was with his closest followers, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take and eat together. The scriptures go on and tell us that likewise, he took the cup after they had eaten. So let's pray and be ready to receive the cup. Father, thank you for the new covenant that you wrote in the blood of Jesus. His blood washes away our sin. Nothing that we can do on our own. But we look to him, we put our faith and our trust in him, transferring from ourselves onto him. And uh, we're, we're so thankful for what you have done and accomplished through Jesus' death on the cross. And we remember and we give thanks now. In his name, amen. Well, as you're seated, feel free to sing along. How deep the Father's love for us.
Jesus said, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Let's take, let's drink together. Amen. Well, let's rise to our feet. We're going to close by singing the chorus of that song that we started our service with today. Let's lift our voices together. What a great, great song that is. I look forward to singing that together over these next weeks and months. Uh, great start to our series. We're so looking forward to jumping in over these next couple weeks on your way out. If you're new to Calvary Church, if you want to connect with us, reminder of the welcome gathering out these back doors down to your right. Love to be able to connect with you. And lunch is served. So if you're interested in lunch, you can head over to Fellowship Hall right now. Uh, God bless you all. Have a great, great day. See you next week.